We've talked about the creation, and now we're talking about the patriarchs. If you don't know what that is, that is um, the fathers or the forefathers of the nation of Israel. They are Abraham, Isaac, <coughs> and Jacob, who is renamed Israel. And then from Israel, he had the 12 kids, and there's that. Okay, so we're going to have to look at a few different things that are kind of important <laughs> Um, for everything. The first thing is that people typically say that um, the historical details of the of the patriarchs is wrong. That they didn't have camels domesticated when Abraham was alive. That all this different stuff. So those are interesting questions. And so uh, another thing is Joseph um, with having a chariot in Egypt. Those are kind of big questions that people have. So we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time. Um, talking about dating the events themselves, because we can't say that they didn't have those things if we don't date them to the correct time. So let's look at some look at look at some problems here. Um, it is nearly impossible to prove or disprove one individual. That is just a thing that happens with ancient history. So as far as Abraham, does he did he exist? Well, nothing with archaeology is ever going to show as one person. Archaeology shows us sweeping glances at people, so there's that problem. Um, but then you have the problem of if he wasn't a real person, where did he come from? People will typically invent the smallest lie and then just kind of build on it to validate it. They won't start with such a complicated idea and then wheedle it out. The so I don't know. Once again, that's possible, but we're at this point. We have to lean to the side that Abraham was a real person, regardless of there's no evidence for him existing, just because you can't go to a historical document with the instant idea that he that it didn't exist. I mean, that goes for with any... any there's the there's something called the Epic of Gilgamesh, this guy who was a warrior who, I mean, people just tried to turn him into a god, and so he tries to find out how to attain, you know, eternal life and all this different stuff. And beyond all those stories we're left with the idea that there probably was a real person. And uh, that's kind of how you have to do with a lot of with a lot of ancient history. The Greeks, with their Iliad and the, and the Odyssey and all that stuff, there probably was a battle for Troy. I mean, we don't necessarily have all the details, but, I mean, the basics, there's no reason to doubt the basics, that there really was a city named Troy and the Greeks were really, you know, at war with it. That's That's totally believable. And so it's just as believable to say that there was just this <laughs> nomad wanderer <laughs> uh, called Abraham. So um, next is the issue of, of history itself. Our, our ancient history is extremely fragmented, and I feel like a lot of times people overlook this. This is kind of a big part of archaeology and history. Um, so there's, there's dating issues. Um, we don't know exactly – like when they date stuff, they don't date it to specific times. They date it to time ranges. That's the first thing, okay? Um, second off, a lot of archaeology, um, and you'll see this on the bottom point there, um, or maybe it's on the next slide, but um, a lot of archaeology is dated by pots, little pieces of broken pots. That's how they date stuff. So just imagine with me how that might not be the most accurate way of dating something and how it potentially leaves room for error. I mean, potentially. Um, you know, you'd have to assume that, you know, they were always up to date with the newest pottery and that they never reused old pottery. And, I mean, it's not an exact kind of situation. Um, but there's a lot of dating issues. Uh, I believe I have it on a later slide. Um, we haven't even figured out uh, Egypt's pharaohs in the right order. So there's that to consider. Also, many pharaohs have multiple possible dates of reign. Then there's some pharaohs that we don't know exactly when they died because it's not necessarily specifically said. So they might have died as early as this or maybe 30 years later. Well, that's a big a big margin of error there. Um, and then there's the problem of sparse records. There's just not a whole lot of records. And even what is found is most oftentimes damaged. Okay. So... Then there's records that existed once upon a time that were lost. And, you know, you have all this, all, the, all these problems. You know, a lot of times what we find is we find a tablet. 
oh, this tablet finally has this information we're looking on, and lines 1 through 13 are wasted. Lines 14 through 15 have one or two words that are readable, and then down here on line 50 or 60, uh, we have a few complete sentences. That's not uncommon. They, they were they were clay. I mean, it's they don't really last that long. And here's another problem that I believe was brought up on, on one of the documentaries we watched. In some places, um, they they didn't write with clay, like in in Babylon and, and Mesopotamia and that kind of stuff. They wrote on uh, papyrus, early paper. Think of it. Just think of it as early paper, and we can all get along. Um, which those don't hang up very well. I mean, any kind of moisture is going to do a lot of damage. And then, don't forget that after this, there was a lot of history that happened between then and now. You know, there's the burning of the Library of Alexandria. <laughs> we don't know all the all the. We don't even know what we lost there. Then we have countless wars that have gone over, gone on in that situation. I mean, we really can't. There's a lot of unsures here. So we're unsure of a lot of the pharaoh's orders, for example, or of their length of reign or their date of reign. That's just that's just a brief glimpse into all the problems that exist just with history. Now with archaeology, a lot of sites have been destroyed. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Jericho, which we'll get into this more later, but Jericho, a lot of the site has actually been eroded, which is a big problem. How they used to build their cities is they would build a site, and then they would build on top of it, and th they would do that. They're called tells, T-E-L-L. -L. And so on these tells, you, you, theoretically, it's like an onion. You peel it back, and you can see the different layers of the, of the history that existed on that site. But that doesn't take into account um, renovations, fires, destruction, war, I mean all kinds of different things, <laughs> or people moving into a city that was abandoned. Um, we see a lot of examples in Canaan, for instance, of people moving from one place to another and just abandoning the city. And you think, why would you just abandon your city? Well, uh, famine, drought, war, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons for that. Um, and then the sites that, uh, uh, not not all sites were destroyed, but then there's a lot of sites that we haven't, haven't discovered. So this comes into play a lot when we're looking at like books like the Book of Joshua and stuff. Um, I already said about how they didn't, uh, about built, being built on top of each other and how they didn't age well. Um, so archaeology and history give us limited scopes of what was, um, of what was, but but they don't give as a, a complete scope. Um, and I already told you about how much of the, the dating is done through uh, the remains of pottery. So this is an an exact science. There's a lot of um, problems with it, and a lot of our dating methods actually destroy the artifact that's being dated. So you really have to be careful with more precise dating, like. Carbon, I believe, is, is one that destroys the artifact. Um, so here's just some quotes to show you what we're up against. Um, this one is by, uh, well, it's by Yamauchi, but uh, uh, Hearth was uh, paraphrasing it. It is a mistake to insist that traditions, including the Old Testament stories, must interlock with other evidences before they can be believed. Little of once, what once existed is now available for study. In other words, it's, it's not a very good idea to go with it like this. The Bible is not true unless we can perfectly fit it into the gridlock of ancient history because there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been found and can't be found. Which brings me to this quote by Kenneth Kitchen who's one of the leading um, – well, actually, he's just done a lot with his life, but that's for a different day, I guess. Absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. That is absolutely true, and especially when you're dealing with little, little things like – Israel, this tiny, tiny nation in Egypt, amidst a civil war and amidst other Semitic people that were also there at the same time. I mean, <laughs> you really can't be too persnickety about this kind of stuff. I, I, I know that this kind of sounds like it's daunting, but it is daunting. <laughs> There's a lot of, a lot of um, confusion when you're dealing with, with archaeology, and it's a mistake to go to it. I'll give you another example. Um, I was reading a book by Jonathan Tubb. I believe it's just called Canaanites. And he w made a lot of sweeping statements. One of the things that he said was, we can't prove Abraham, which is true. So let's just say he could have existed. Um, but then he goes on to argue that that Israel was basically the Canaanites and that Yahweh was nothing more than, than a Canaanite god. 
and that Ashira was actually his consort, his his woman goddess to play hanky with. But he's taken some very big liberties with that kind of stuff, and we'll look at this when we look at later, because well, we'll just look at that later. But um, the thing I want you to get from all this is that. With so much missing, you can't go to it with the idea of we have the basic and we just miss the in particulars. We have the in particulars and we've missed the basic. See what I mean? Think of it like a painting that instead of a painting that you scratched off a few places, think of it as a plain canvas with just a few pieces in the painting. To show you another thing of what I'm talking about, here's another um, quote by the leading archaeologist, by the way, Robert McSee Adams, which – was a big deal. Okay, he's dead now, but he was a big deal when he was alive. And anybody who knows archaeology would know him. Uh, we probably have some knowledge, other than having walked over the surface, of less than one percent, and it may be one tenth of one percent of existing sites. I myself must have mapped five thousand mounds, and that's possibly only one. Tenths of 1%. When I say that there's a lot of data that's missing, I'm not exaggerating. We know very little of what once what once was. And remember, we don't know in particulars. We know the, the general. Okay, so there was a people here called the Egyptians. And we don't really know what their life was like necessarily, but we, knew, we know that at this time, either this guy or that guy or possibly that guy was a pharaoh. That's what we're looking at, okay? So, and that brings us to the question, so how do we date the, the patriarchs of Israel? Well, thanks to the hard work of a lot of people like um, Thiel, uh, Kitchen, uh, well, those two by themselves have done phenomenal um, in helping us date, but... The monarchy, which is the, the period that Israel had kings, so everything from like uh, first and second kings and first and second chronicles, um, a lot of first and second Samuel, that kind of stuff. We're pretty sure on the dating of that. We're like nearly a hundred percent. So then we're pretty sure of everything after that. The exile when Babylon came and, and destroyed Judah, when Israel came back from Babylon, all that stuff is pretty easy to date. Um, and thanks to a lot of recent new uh, recent uh, uh, discoveries, we, we we can date things in Jesus' time and all that kind of stuff, and 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 that's all hel all helpful. But what about before that? See, we have a little bit of a problem because J the book of Judges is not chronological. It hops around, and it doesn't tell us how long of a period of time was between the Israel entering into Canaan. All the way to Israel's first king. It doesn't tell us how long of a, of a period of time happened. It just says at this place at time in, in Canaan, uh, this, uh, this judge came and saved Israel. And there was peace in that area for this many years. Okay, but what about Israel as a whole? Because Israel wasn't really a nation at that time. They were more like scattered tribes. They weren't really unified until King uh, Saul, and even then they were kind of eh, – he really only got a few of the tribes together. King David was the first one to turn this ragtag team into an actual nation, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, of problems there. So that brings us to the question of, okay, so how do we possibly date this? The only reference we have of how long of a period of time it was is found in 1 Kings 6 1, and it says – in the 480th year after Israel left the land of Egypt, King Saul uh, either finished or started the temple. I don't, I don't remember which. But So we have a 480 years. Okay, so that brings, that brings a few questions. 480 years literal or rounded? Is there something they're trying to get across, or did, was that literally? And if so, how did they count those years? How did they get that number? Because it does, it's not found in the Bible, so that would mean that they – Guessed? Some people think it's a guess because if you multiply 12 by however many – or 20 by however many or something like that, you get 480. Um, I think it's 12 by however much. Uh, but so that leaves us with a whole bunch of questions. We don't know. Um, and then you get to the New Testament. It really doesn't help us figure that out either. 
So traditionally, people have done an, an exact dating, which would date the Exodus at 1445 BC. Um, however, there's no proof for uh, for an Exodus at that time, none. So then, what others have done, Kenneth Kitchen actually did this, which re regrettably, I disagree with him massively. He says it happened in the 1200s because of the mention of Ramses, which we'll talk about that later. But that still brings us to the problem that there's no proof for an exodus there either. So rather than saying, where is their evidence, people have stuck to dates that, that are just based off of one number that we're unsure if it's an exact number or not. So then we get to the question, okay… What about the period of Abraham to Joseph in Egypt? Do we have that? Can we can we know how long that was? That is very very specifically mentioned in the Bible. It says very specifically 430 years. It says it a hundred times, and then it says 400 years as well. So we know it's either 400 or 430 years. Now we'll look at that in just a second. But so then we we have to ask ourselves, okay, if there is no exact occurrence of an exodus hap happening 480 years precisely um, from from this period in 1 Kings 6-1 to an exodus having supposedly happened, was there any evidence for an exodus around that time? Let's say within 50 years. And we find do we do find proof for an exodus in 1479? That's 30 years off. Why is it 30 years off? Well, this hold on. There's a lot of reasons why it could be 30 years off. First off, maybe they were just rounding it down or estimating or something like that. Second off, maybe we don't have our Egyptian pharaoh dating corrected. Remember I said that there's a lot of things that we're having problems with with the pharaohs? There is a possibility of error. So those are just two reasons, which may seem small, but those are actually substantial reasons. Um, so that's proof of, of that happening within 50 years. So, okay, if we say, okay, 1479... Let's say that that is the right date, and we'll use that as the backdrop for dating the dating the patriarchs. Okay, so we're working backwards from the Exodus. How long was Israel in Egypt then? Now, remember the genealogies are not complete, so they're not going to be much help in dating. They can give us a few highlights, that kind of stuff, but they're not going to be much exact, precise help. So let's look at what the Bible says. Genesis 15, 13, first off. says this. Then the Lord <coughs> said to Abraham, or I'm sorry, to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and... Uh, will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Okay, we have our first number, 400 years. All right, now let's go down to Exodus 12, 40 through 41. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Okay, all right. So now we have 430 days. Okay. Years. Yes, yes, years. Sorry, years. That That's correct. Now, Acts 7-6. Okay, Acts 7, 6 says this, And God spoke to this effect that his offspring would be sojourners, uh, sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. Okay, so he's quoting Genesis fifteen thirteen. All right. Gal Galatians three sixteen through 17. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring... It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. Okay, 
So here we have 430 years from when? See, it says in verse 16, the promises made to Abraham. Okay, all right. So he's talking about going all the way back to Abraham. Okay, so now we have a fairly fairly precise record here. Okay, if the Exodus was in 1479, let's just say exactly 400 years. 15, 16, 17, 18. 1879. Okay, all right. Now we have something to work with. That means Abraham must have been after 2000 BC. Okay, this is incredibly important. Incredibly important. Next week we'll start looking at the um, at the proof that Abraham was able to own camels because camels were domesticated. We'll look at that in, in next week. So the question becomes which was it 400 or 430 years now some people would say okay it's rounded 400 years being not precise but it could be 400 years like you know it's somewhere around 400 years okay all right and then 430 years would be the exact number that's totally possible totally possible um but there is another option okay it was 30 years from Abraham receiving the promise from God to when Isaac was ridiculed by Ishmael, who was the son of an Egyptian. Which would have meant that the persecution started with Isaac when he was made fun of his Egypt by his Egyptian brother, which would be 430 years from the beginning of the promise. Wow, that's interesting. And f 30 years later, 400 years, Isaac being made being made fun of. Now, if I, if this dating is right, okay, that would mean that it's only 250 years, 215 years, roughly, from Joseph to Moses. Not 400 years from Joseph to Moses. Okay, if I'm wrong then that would mean we would have to push Moses, I mean, sorry, Abraham, before 2000 BC, and then we would probably have problems with saying he had camels. So keep that in mind. Um, and you can't say, okay, let's move it forward, because remember, we don't have any proof of an exodus after 1479. And we'll look at this later, but the proof of the law being written dates it, the law was written after 1400, before 1200. We can date that. So we can't push Joseph and Israel forward. So then people say, well, what about this moving it back to 2500s? We have the same problems with the dating. So then that takes us to another problem. Well, okay, what about in that documentary where they just rewrote everything? They just redid the timing, you know, all, all that dating and stuff like they did on those documentaries. Y you can do that, but then you run into whole new sets of problems. Um, first off, there's really no... Um, proof for doing that so whereas it all fits very nicely it you can't validate your findings that that's a problem uh, second off whereas that fixes the issue with some of the dating it creates new problems with for instance camels and stuff because if you redate everything then that would still put it where it doesn't where it doesn't fit so I mean with with, with when camels were domesticated and the proof for the exodus and all these different things. Now all you've done is you've complicated the issue. So yes, our dating could be massively off, but until we have more evidence saying that it is massively off, we would be careful to keep the dating how it is until we have more evidence. Okay, so Egypt may have had at least uh, may have. <laughs> Okay, let me just say this differently. I have this written a little bit retarded here. Let me say it differently. Egypt may have had influence in the land of Canaan when Abraham was there because it says that Abraham is, was in southern Canaan. So they might be saying, Egypt, you'll be in the land of Egypt, including the southernmost part of Canaan in Egypt. It doesn't look like they had control of southern Canaan. But they might have had influence over southern Canaan, in which case it could be considered as kind of like under Egypt's wing at that time. 
So it's just some things to think about. Um, there's a little bit of a possibility in different different interpretations there, as you can see. But I believe I've 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 presented them all to you. So. 430 years, not in Egypt proper, but with Egyptian overlords. Okay, we can deal with that. Um, Abraham went down to Egypt as well. It, it, the year of the promise that the promise was made, e uh, Abraham went down into Egypt. It says that very, very clearly in uh, uh, Genesis uh, 13, I believe, 12 or 13. And um, I believe he actually makes two trips, but th the second trip isn't really re relevant. Um, point being that it could be talking about Abraham going down to Egypt. So that still ends us with 430 years, okay? I, whichever, whichever way you look at that. So that would mean that Abraham was born in 1984 BC, Isaac was born in 1884 BC, and it, Jacob was born in 1824 BC. Joseph would then have been born in 1733 BC. Okay, so you can I have all their deaths written down there. Um, Abraham died in 1809, Isaac died in 1704, Jacob died in 1677, and Joseph died in 1623. So that's all the dating. Now that's going to be important when we talk about the proof for the patriarchs. Because remember, the Bible says that it gives us a glimpse of what life was like for them. If that glimpse doesn't fit with the evidence that we have for Canaan and for Egypt at that time, we know a few things. Number one, the story was was either fabricated, or two, um, we, we misdated, it, misdated it, or three, um, we haven't found the evidence yet. So those that's what we're going to look at. And so let, next week we'll, have, we'll be able to figure out if this dating correctly affirms what other history shows. Okay? So, uh, is, are you guys writing stuff down? Well, I mean, you both are. I have. I have to look at oh, okay. All right. Um, I can come back. Okay. Are you okay? Because I don't want to this lesson to take too long. So two more things I want to look at. That would mean that Moses was born in 1559, and the Exodus was in 1479, and that Moses then died in about 1439. Now, remember, the law has to have been written after 1400s and before 1200s. We know that the law had that somebody modified the law to minor extent, minor extent. Not changing any content necessarily, but that it was put in its final form after Moses. Now, the Bible even says this, so don't get your panties in a wad. I'm not saying the Bible is not relevant. I mean, uh, preserved. We'll come back to that, okay? Just hold on. That brings us to the next problem. How long was Joseph's, jo I'm sorry, Joshua's campaign? Because remember, if we can't date the Exodus, maybe we could date the campaign of Israel into Canaan. When did they go in? And, well, that brings us with a lot of problems. Um, the first off, as I mentioned, Jer Jericho is not being much help right now. We'll look at this later. At, I'll, I'll show you why it's not being much help. We'll look at that another time. But then um, the other city that they burned, they only burned two cities. Jericho and the city in the north. I forgot what it was called. Um, uh, the... Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it when, when we get to the campaign. But um, And that city actually had burnings at two different times. And um, after one of the burning, people still lived in it. So neither of those sites are helping as much with the dating. The other sites, there was a lot of stuff that happened in Canaan that is pro prohibiting, prohibiting us from dating. So we can't do our dating based off of the campaign is what I'm getting at. We have to start from somewhere else. Then we have the problem of how long was Joshua's campaign. And here's the bad thing. The Bible never tells us. No! It doesn't tell us how old Joshua was when he started working with Moses. Dang it. We can assume he was at least 20 years old because of the law's requirements for people to start work at 20 and end at, what was it, 50 or whatever. Uh, but we can't know for sure. So there's that whole problem because remember he wasn't actually a Lev Levite, so the rule might not have applied to him. I don't I don't know. Maybe Moses took him when he was a, a really young kid. Acts gives us, gives us a clue, but this is what it says. It says about about 20 years. In other words, I don't know how long this is, but somewhere around maybe let's just say 20 years. What that tells us is that the writer of Acts was not trying to be literal. He was saying our tradition says 20 years. I'm just going to go ahead and say 20 years because. I, the Bible doesn't say. 
So we have a big problem with that. We can't date the campaign. We can't know how long the campaign was. We can't know how long the book of Judges, Judges is. So we have this, this one thing that is our anchor. Proof of an exodus from Egypt. Thank God there is something we can anchor to. With that being said, that will close us out for this week. We'll start up next week with, with looking at the lives of the patriarchs and whether it matches up with the history of that time that we said. Okay. Any questions before we close out for today? Did the Israel being in Egypt started with Joseph? Yes. When they called his family? Mm -hmm. And that was when they multiplied and they made Israel? Right. Oh, okay. Well, technically Abraham did, did visit Egypt, but he didn't stay. He just went in, went out. Okay. No other questions? No. Okay. Good question, Diana. So if Joseph would have went in Egypt in the first place, there would have not been them in Egypt, right? Say that again? If Joseph didn't go to Egypt, if he wasn't sold, mm -hmm. Israel would have not been in Egypt. Well, it's hard to know because Jacob and his sons would still have ran out of food, <laughs> and they would have had to go somewhere. Eventually. Yeah, eventually, but Egypt wouldn't have been preserved because Joseph wouldn't have been there to save their lives. Right. So I don't know where they would have gone. <laughs> Egypt would have been destroyed, and Canaan would have been destroyed, so where else would they have gone? I guess maybe Syria or something. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> it really worked out perfectly how God did it. We'll just end it with that.